This is COVID Pulse, a map I made in collaboration with my friend and colleague Jinan Zhang. It shows cases of coronavirus, novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, since February. It's updated daily, pulling in data from the Johns Hopkins University Service of U.S. Counties. And we aggregate it and render it as spark lines. At this scale, it's aggregated to the state view, and you can mouse over this to get a little bit more information. If you're curious about a place, say Iowa looks like it's uptrending, you can select this and get more detailed information about it. This method of data display is called a sparkline. A sparkline is a small word-sized graphic that can fit into the context of the thing that it's describing. It's an old technique. Galileo drew little pictures of the shape of Saturn as he saw it right in his manuscript as though it was a word. And there are a lot of studies that say it's always best to fully integrate graphics with the words that are describing that theme instead of saying refer to figure 12 on another page. I mean, obviously the mind does a better job of connecting things when it's put into context. Also, a sparkline is very data dense. They're, they were coined sparklines by Edward Tufte. Edward Tufte likes to talk about the data to ink ratio in any graphic. And a sparkline is only data. There's no ink. So ink being things that's not data, like the grid of the chart, labels, axes, tick marks, that kind of thing, just showing you the data. But sometimes you want a little bit more information and you want the context of labeled axes. And so we've provided that on selection. This model also follows the user experience description of Jared Poole, who says that users on the web navigate a lot like a predator navigates via scent. They see something or they smell something kind of interesting and then they follow it up with a little bit more information and then they pursue that information. So we've got high level visuals. We've got the second order of visualization in the form of this tooltip, and then the third order of visualization in the form of these little reports that appear down here. We're aggregating to the state level, but when you zoom in to the county level, we break it out to the county level data, which is actually the enumeration unit that the data is collected in and disseminated in. And they're color coded by these stages of outbreak that are calculated via an algorithm created by Charlie Fry, also here at Esri. These colors are optional. If you'd like to see just the spark lines themselves, obviously that's an option. Turn that on, you can turn it off. When I was looking at this for the first time, I noticed I mean, my goodness, there are some really dramatic spikes in some of these areas. What's going on? I mean, look, look at these places. Trousdale. Trousdale only has a population of just under 12,000. Now, why is it that in one day they could have almost 900 new cases? It's because, and I didn't know this, of course, there's a prison there. And due to the reporting structures, all the cases were reported in the course of a couple days, and you have a massive spike bike in the new case count and you have none before that and very few after that. So this is an example of maps helping you ask better questions or answering questions you wouldn't have thought to ask. I saw these, I googled Trousdale, Tennessee and every article was about an outbreak at the prison there. And I looked at these other locations and they also correspond to large prisons. There's a couple other spikes over here in the Midwest that correspond to meat processing facilities. And they all had this spike early in the outbreak, mid-April. There are some places that have the, the typical second wave pattern. And New Orleans is a pretty clear example of this. Early on in the outbreak, it corresponded with Mardi Gras, and Mardi Gras happened in late February, at which time coronavirus was already spreading. We just didn't necessarily know it for certain. And so you get this dramatic increase in late March and early April. And then it was, it was reduced. These are new case counts per day. So the new cases went down, plateaued, and had uh, marginal numbers of new cases for a long time. And then when it warmed up and people started going back inside, breathing circulated air, sharing the air that they're breathing, cases went up a little bit. So there's questions that we can ask because of data like this, where we say, well, why is this happening? And they give us clues that we can then follow up on.
and it looks like there is a recent increase in this area. So speaking of recent increases in this area, where might there be instances of increased cases? Um, university towns um, may house outbreaks as students from all over the state and the country gather together, whether classes end up being in person or not in person. Let's look at New York City, another pretty well, it was it was one of the early locations, and they had just a, a very severe outbreak in New York City. This is per capita. All of these numbers are proportional to the population that's there. Because it's normalized by population in that way, we can look across different geographic areas with wildly differing populations and compare them, because this is just a rate. It's the proportion of people who are recently infected in an area, not the total number. But you can also find the total number here in the mouse over. But look at this just dramatic increase in this collection of counties around New York City. That stands in contrast to a place like California, specifically Los Angeles, which early on in the outbreak had comparably few cases. You know, proportionally, they had very few cases. And it increased dramatically only recently, midsummer, And now it appears to be tapering back down. You can see that we have the number of new cases per capita here. And this mirrors the spark line that you're seeing on the map. These shapes ought to be consistent with each other. This second chart is the per capita deaths associated with coronavirus or COVID-19 illness. And what you might see when you compare these two um, units of measure is a slight lag from cases to deaths per capita. So we're looking at new cases per capita as a spark line. We can change this to deaths per capita. And when we do this, you can toggle between the two and see there is a lag in spikes of deaths after new cases because of the period of time associated with an illness, of course. Also, more interestingly to me and more optimistically, is that newer spikes of cases appear to have lower spikes of deaths per capita. Why is that? I don't know. I'm not a medical expert. Maybe we're getting better at treating things. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. But again, maps help us ask better questions, questions that we might not have considered asking in the first place. And lastly, there's a visualization option here called cumulative of cases. This is just another way of looking at the data. Instead of new cases per capita, this just adds them up throughout the outbreak. And it gives us another way of interpreting the trend associated with a spark line. It'll never go down because it's an additive count, cumulative cases. But the way that this line wobbles and the sinuous shape of it can tell us something about the timing and the severity of the outbreak in these areas across the country. And when you look at them as a group, you can start seeing geographic patterns, perhaps, associated with this. So again, we see that California trend with very little early on, and then only recently, a pretty dramatic increase. That's especially the case in the American Southeast. So uh, look at Florida. I mean, a, a more recent increase, and then it appears to be slowing down slightly. We see this double hump associated with a second wave in Louisiana. We see what appears to be a pretty dramatic current increase in North Dakota. And then we can always check this with the cases per, new cases per capita. North Dakota appears to be a place where new cases per capita is on the upswing. Generally throughout the United States, cases appear to be going down or the number of new cases appear to be decreasing, um, except for some, some areas. So this is COVID pulse. Now, where did this come from? Why did we make this? I was originally, well, I've, I've actually made or been involved in the design of sparkline based maps in the past. Many years ago, I worked with a team that mapped out bot attacks, digital attacks throughout the world. And we used sparklines to show that trend because there was a crucial intersection of geography and time. Sparklines do a great job of showing an incredible amount of data and in intuitive fashion. We can see the trend of an area and we can see the waves rippling out from different locations at different times. More recently, I saw the work of Riley Champagne of National Geographic, and he put together these spark lines, they were spark lines, of the cases of Spanish flu in 1918. The moral of the story there was watch out for the second wave, because they had cities that showed the first wave and then a very alarming second wave, which was characteristic of the spread of the 1918 flu. The spark lines were labeled by their 
city and gosh i wondered if you were just to put these on a map geographically would there be a pattern associated with these would there be a ripple effect where you could kind of see geographically an origin and then a spread branching out from that area especially back then when travel was slower than it is today and so that that got me wondering and thinking and tinkering and then i thought well why do this for the 1918 flu when we can do it for coronavirus which is our current situation so i i checked with janan and we started building this based on the Johns Hopkins data. Another influence after that, after Riley's spark lines, was a work by Matthew Rogerson, and he showed cumulative cases in regions of France. There was just so much communication power in this way of visualizing the outbreak, and it was so powerful. We're used to seeing maps that show you right now color-coded counties or states and countries or bubbles growing um, but that only shows you one moment in time but the nature of an epidemic is that it moves and it changes a visual sense of that trend is so important and that's why i think a spark line does a reasonable job of communicating immense amounts of data the fluctuations of that data in time locally and then a comparative sense or the movement of an outbreak geographically. Time and place, when you couple time and place, a lot of insights can be revealed. Thank you.